Good. Um, well, thanks so much for inviting us along to talk a bit about what IBM has been doing with Swift. Um, we're going to talk about Swift on the server side um, and a, a little bit about a web framework that IBM has been writing, which is called Kitora or Kitora, depending on your pronunciation choice. Um, quick introduction to who uh, we are. My name's Ian Partridge. Um, I'm one of the developers on Swift at IBM. I work in the IBM Runtime Technologies Organization. Um, uh, my background is originally from Java. I've been working as part of the development and support team for IBM's Java implementation for over 10 years. So a lot of debugging, production, JEE app servers in that time. Um, Chris. So yes, um, I work in the same team as Ian. Um, background's similar. I've spent 15 years doing JVMs and Java runtimes. After that, I spent two years doing a similar job on Node.js, so working with the V8 runtime, LibUV, and so on. And since December, um, we've both worked, moved over to, to working on Swift, which is kind of interesting because it's you know, another evolution of what we've done before. And it gives us kind of the advantages of a lot of the things we have done before, and we've seen the best ways of doing them, and we've definitely seen some of the worst ways of doing them. So we're kind of using that knowledge from Java and Node to try and steer Swift in the best possible direction, particularly as it starts to come over to other platforms and onto the server. So Swift at IBM is the team within IBM, which is mostly split between the UK and the US, which is working to accelerate mobile-first development. So mobile-first development is the idea that nowadays people don't don't have to start with the back end. You don't have to start with the database, which you then you build the web server on top of, and then you look at the front end afterwards. Startups are now, a lot of them, you start with the app, right? And you build the back end to go with the app. Um, so mobile first is all about taking that, that, that way of designing your systems and then providing a back end to go with that. Um, so we're working to bring Swift to the cloud. Um, and there's three particular parts of that, which are the package catalog we're working on, Kaitora I've already mentioned, and the Swift Sandbox, which I'll demo briefly to you at the end. Um, but now Chris is going to take you through some Swift on Linux stuff. Yep. So we're going to start very, very high level. So this is a, a block diagram of some of the components that you've got if you're running Swift on Linux today. So this is all using the, the development masterline. So it's what will be uh, Swift 3.0, and this is the current status. So the components in, in green are kind of part of Swift.org. Uh, the components in and are Swift code. Um, the components that are yellow are C code, and the components which are orange are Objective-C. So you'll notice first, no Objective-C on Linux. That's, that's Darwin only. Um, and the other thing that might... Um, stand down is that foundation on Linux is Swift code and foundation on Darwin is Objective-C, so they're not the same. Now you can actually use the foundation that's on Linux on Darwin and it's called Swift Foundation. So the same code is available on both, but when you program to foundation on Darwin platforms, you're actually using Objective-C under the covers. So what we've been doing is trying to make all of these components on the Linux side actually work together and provide the same APIs and the same API surface that you see um, on Darwin when you program for Mac or iOS devices. Now, the situation is going to get a little bit better as we move towards uh, Swift 3. So what's happening is, um, so anyone that's tried to use Foundation today in Swift will realize that the API isn't fantastic. Right? It's all NS. You're dealing with NS objects. You've got to deal with bridging. Now, the approach as we move towards Swift 3 is going to be that implicit bridging, so the ability to basically bridge between Objective-C and Swift objects, is going to start to go away. Now, that might sound like a regression. We're going to take something that was actually working and made life easy um, on Darwin platforms and get rid of it. Now, they're going to get rid of it because they're going to replace it with better Swift APIs. So you'll just have a Swift API to use, and you won't have to do bridging at all. So that's happening in two places, really, or we expect it to uh, for Swift 3. One is around Foundation. So Foundation will be much more usable, and it's actually going to look a bit more like you're using the same component on Linux and Darwin, because you've got the same green layer around the outside, 
and that's happening for dispatch as well. So whilst dispatch as a C module is the same on both platforms, um, you've been able to use better bridging on Darwin than you can on Linux, and it's now going to have a Swift API around it, so it'll be the same on both. You won't have to deal with opaque pointers and the like. So we're trying to move to a model where you know, the underpinnings may be different between the two platforms. Right? You may use an Objective-C library for foundation on Darwin, um, but the API surface is going to look the same, and it's going to be far more Swift-like APIs. And long term, we hope that will happen for security and other libraries like that as well. So that's where we're moving to for, for Swift on Linux. So the next question is, why Swift on the server, which is kind of where IBM is focusing as well. We're bringing it to Linux, and then we're bringing it onto big machines. So one of the reasons is performance. Um, so if you look at that chart, um, this is a benchmark called nBody. Right? It's a, a fairly small self-contained benchmark that does basically just calculations. Right? It's going to burn 100% CPU if you write the application correctly. Now, the fastest form of this is C and C++. So the fastest implementation that there is is running in C. Now, next to that, you have these group of modern native languages, as they're being called. So Go, Swift, Rust. Right? These are C replacements. They are very low-level languages, but they now all have type inference. Um, they're all statically compiled, etc. And they've all got actually really good performance with the advantage of you no longer have to write your memory management. You don't have to worry about pointers. Right? There is no star and ampersand anymore. And what we're finding with modern native languages is they're really performant, but easier to write than C. Um, and their performance is actually much the same as Java. Now, one of the differences between the two is Java is a, um, a dynamically compiled language. Right? It compiles once you start running the application. Now, that has one advantage, which is it can actually watch the way the application runs and optimize it according to the way the application is actually executing. Now, the, the basic example here is uh, for loops. Right? Normally, you assume your code is going to go around a for loop several times and break out once. Now, that's true 99% of the times, which is why compilers optimize that way. But it's actually possible to write a for loop where the standard case is to break out and only go around the loop if a condition is met. Now, Java will actually spot this and compile it the other way at runtime because it can actually watch the way ex code executes and compile it once it started executing. So Java has that advantage, but its disadvantage is it's really slow to begin with. Right? It's not fast from startup because it takes a while for it to compile the code, and it takes a while for it to actually spot these changes in behavior. So modern native languages are, are fast, and as fast as Java, but without this problem that it has to wait for execution to start. Now, it tends to be much faster than scripting languages. The fastest of those two are Dart and JavaScript, um, because they have just-in-time compilers just like Java. And then Ruby, PHP, Python, Erlang, they are very, very slow for computation. Um, I actually truncated the chart at 100 seconds, because some of them took like nine minutes. Um, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the ones on the left. So Swift is actually really fast. This is a good thing. Now, what makes it more interesting is if you start to overlay memory usage. So C, C++, fast and small. The modern native languages are also small. Um, I'll point out that um, for Swift, we, we ran these benchmarks a number of months ago. Um, things have improved since then, um, both for performance and memory usage. So that's coming down a little bit. Um, but all of the modern native languages are much, much smaller than running something in a Java runtime. And that's because the Java runtime needs extra memory to watch the way it, the code's executing and to compile it at runtime and to save all that compiled code. Oh, and it has a huge garbage collector. And that takes a lot of memory too. So it's just as JVM languages are just as fast, but they're significantly bigger. And then you've got scripting languages. Those actually tend to be quite small in terms of memory footprint, but we know that they're really slow. So when you overlay the two, and you actually include performance and memory, you can see the standout winners are basically C and the modern native languages. So they are combined fast and small. Um, and they're easier to write than C. So that's why there's this focus on modern native languages. Um, and the reason why this is key 
is if anybody has actually looked at the charging models for clouds today, right, they charge you by memory. They don't charge you by CPU. Right? You go to um, Amazon, you go to a platform as a service provider, they're going to charge you according to how much memory you want in your deployment. And the CPU just happens to come along with your, your um, memory provisions. So if you're running a modern native language or you're running C, then you can actually get many, many more deployments for the same amount of money than if you're running Java or, a, or particularly a scripting language. So running modern native languages like Swift is really interesting for deploying server-side and into the cloud. So as a, a server-side developer, and particularly one that you know, can, cares about how much it's costing me to run my application, Swift looks really good. Now, there is another advantage, and this is something they talk about a lot for, for JavaScript, right? They talk about isomorphic programming, and the idea that you can write some code and you can actually run it in the client and on the server at the same time. And the premise is pretty simple, right? Um, you may have to format dates, and you want to make sure that the way that you format the date is actually identical in both places, and you've been told that you need to use you know, DRY, dry code, right? Don't repeat yourself. Don't implement several things, don't cut and paste. So what actually starts to happen when you have the same code on the client and the server is you can create modules for Swift, and you'll be able to deploy them to both. And in fact, we can go a stage further and start looking at ways in which you can actually have local and remote procedure calls. So you have a module that implicitly under the covers creates a Swagger described REST API, allows you to do remote calls where a lot of the heavy lifting is being done on the server, and the client can reduce the amount of CPU burn, therefore memory usage that, um, that is done. And you can start looking at compressed transfer between the two to reduce network bandwidth. So you can start actually deploying the same code in both places, reducing the amount of coding time, and still providing a REST API for clients that happen to need a browser interface to it. So this is a couple of the reasons why server-side Swift is starting to become really, really interesting. And that's why IBM has created Kitura, uh, but there's, I think, at least nine other uh, web frameworks which have um, arrived on the server already. And well, that's with you know, um, Swift only being open source and available on Linux for five, six, seven months. So there's things like Zwo, Vapor, Perfect, Blackfish, uh, Swifty, Swifter. Um, there's yeah, more than I can remember off the top of my head. Um, so it's a growing ecosystem. It's very, very interesting. It's got a lot of characteristics that makes it sense as a, a server-side developer, but it also allows you to have these server and client components running together. And I'll now hand back over to Ian, who's going to talk about um, Kitura itself. Thanks, Chris. Um, so as Chris mentioned, Kitura is a web framework. Um, there are plenty of Swift web frameworks around at the moment. Most of them are kind of hobby projects on GitHub. There are some which are more professional. Um, we think Kitura is a pretty good one. Um, the Kitura is cool and web frameworks in Swift are cool because they allow a gen whole new generation of native digital client developers, people who are writing apps for the App Store, to also write their code in Swift for the back end and deploy into the cloud. Um, so Kitura is entirely open source. It's, op it's released under the Apache 2 license. So anyone can download it, try it out, kick the tires and see what they think. Um, the approach we took with Kitura is to really focus on reusing core components from Swift. So um, the web framework itself uses foundation. Uh, it uses the Swift package manager. Um, it combines that with um, sort of foundational technologies like Grand Central Dispatch um, to, to create a web framework which it, it is truly built on the Swift.org open source project. Um, we also pull in some libraries from the community, things like Swifty JSON for JSON parsing, uh, and we've written some adapters, things like uh, an adapter for the Redis data store, um, and all that comes together to, to create the web framework. So how would you use it? I'm not going to do live coding because no one, no one wants to watch someone else do typos for 10 minutes. Um, so first of all, create a project directory. 
change into the directory, swift build minus init. Um, so here you can see we're using the Swift Package Manager. Swift Package Manager is coming in Swift 3. It's under active development now. Um, it's, it's usable. It's, uh, it's currently being developed at a rapid pace. Once you've done Swift build minus init, you get a basic Swift package directory, which has a package.swift and a main file and a directory where you can put your tests. Um, inside your packet.swift, you then need to add Kitora as a dependency for your project. Um, so this is pretty standard stuff. If anyone's created a Swift package before, you'll have had to do this. Um, you uh, drop in the GitHub URL of our repository uh, as a dependency, say which version you want to pick up and develop off. Um, currently, we're on two weeks sprints, so in two weeks' time, that'll be .17. Um, then you actually get to write your web server, right? Um, you, you need a router. This is what's going to actually handle the incoming HTTP requests. Um, so uh, you define what are known as routes. Uh, so this is saying if, you, if anyone hits the URL slash hello, this is the code you're going to run. And if any of you have done any Node.js development and you're familiar with the Express web framework for Node.js, you'll feel right at home because Kitora is designed to, to, to closely model that uh, representation of how, of, of how a web framework should be defined. Um, so that's pretty simple. Obviously, um, it's just one line of code. In this example, we're just going to say, hello world. Um, you could add a second route for another link. So if anyone goes to slash hello.json, in this case, we'll return hello world as, uh, as a JSON payload instead. Um, this is using the Swifty JSON package that I mentioned earlier. And the final thing you need to do is add a new HTTP server with the router that you're interested in to run on a specific port. And then when you call Kitura.run, that kicks off the server, it starts, and the Kitura.run call actually never comes back. Um, it would go off into the run loop. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So there's a basic web server, which is uh, going to serve up some HTML in a dozen lines of code or something. Um, once you've written it, you need to compile it. Um, this is a bit convoluted at the moment um, because, as I said, Swift Package Manager is a still under active development, so there's a few flags, options, etc., which need to be passed through. We're working to remove these over time and simplify the thing. Um, but we do provide a, a Kitura build GitHub project, which sort of abstracts away that, so you don't need to worry about it. And then once you've built it, all you do is just run it from the command line. Uh, and if you open a browser, um, you can go to the, the root URL, in which case you'll get our splash screen, or the hello root we defined will just give you hello world, or the hello.json will give you the JSON payload that we talked about. So that couldn't be much easier. Um, if you'd like to give it a try, kick the tires, um, we, we actually make it even easier than that. There's, we've got a few sample projects which you can clone. Um, so there's a project called Kitura Sample, where all you have to do is make run, and it does all that for you, and it'll start up a local web server on your MacBook or whatever. Um, or alternatively, we have another project called Kitura Starter Bluemix. Um, this, actually, this also has uh, code for doing automatic pushes to uh, IBM's platform as a service, Bluemix. Um, Bluemix is built on Cloud Foundry, so all you have to do is clone that repository, CF push, and away you go. And just to prove that, we're going to pray to the demo gods. <laughs> Can you see? Yes. So we have an empty directory. I have Kitura Starter Bluemix. We're going to copy the git URL. I told you you'd have to get to watch me make typos. <laughs> git clone. So that will pull that down change into the directory. You can see it's got the basic structure there, package.swift, um, the Kitura build project I mentioned early to simplify the, the make file dance. Uh, and all I should have to do is do CF push, and it spots the manifest file, creates me a new application on Bluemix, creates a new root using two random words, and this time it's non-electrolytic antipathogen. Um, and it's going to compile my application um, 
upload that to Bluemix, and in a few minutes, we'll be able to hit the URL live, hopefully. Um, but while that uploads, because no one wants to watch files, code compile and then files upload to the internet, um, I'll just jump back into here. I'll talk briefly about the Swift package catalog. So I mentioned that Kitura is built on Swift package manager. So Swift package manager is coming in Swift 3. Um, it's uh, going to be the official way to package up and deploy your Swift packages. Um, uh, IBM's created a website called the Swift Package Catalog, which is, again, it's hosted on Bluemix. There's a URL there. Um, and the, the idea of it is that we're, we're, we're crawling GitHub looking for projects, open source projects, which are implementing, implemented as a Swift package. Um, so you can go on the website, say, I'm, I need a JSON parser, search for JSON, it'll find you one. Um, you can explore dependencies between the packages, you can see what license they're under. So, um, and you, if you're an author, if you've written some open source code um, as, as a Swift package, you can upload that yourself um, to GitHub and then send us the URL and we'll add it to our index as well. Um, it's got some features like um, featured packages. Um, recently, you can now log in and save your favorite Swift packages, things like that. Next thing just to talk briefly about is um, the IBM Swift Sandbox. So uh, this is another website. Has anyone heard of the Swift Sandbox, used it? Yeah, hands in the air, good stuff. Um, so the IBM Swift Sandbox is an interactive sandbox for rapid prototyping, experimenting in Swift. Um, it runs in the cloud and it runs on Linux. Um, we'll try a second demo, it's too, too scary. Uh, so. Here's the sandbox, which I've loaded. Um, this is what you get when you, when you hit the home page. Hello world, and there's a run button, bu button down the bottom, which you can press. Oh, it says disconnected. Let me reconnect. Yeah. So if I run, then it says hello world. Now, what it's actually doing is taking the code that you're writing on the, in the little editor window on the left, packaging it up, sending it to Bluemix, and then it's running your Swift code inside a Docker container on Bluemix. We've got some pre-packaged little examples which you can load. So, I don't know, there's a Fibonacci one, which um, is just some sample code to generate a Fibonacci number. Um, and then, you can save your work. There's a new features we just added, which is um, the ability to log in using your GitHub ID or your IBM Bluemix account so that you can save any snippets you've got. People are really liking this, actually, because we, we, all the time we see people, if you, if you go on Stack Overflow and you search for Swift questions quite a lot of time now, people have got links to the sandbox for the code that they're discussing. So it's really nice that people are using it in these interactive ways. Let's see if our demo's working. Oh, it's still going, crikey. Um, if I switch back to the presentation. So if you haven't had a play with the sandbox, please do so. It'd be great to see more people using that and evangelizing it. Um, one thing to just bear in mind, though, is it, uh, it is running on Linux. So um, the, the, the level of functionality that's available in the sandbox exactly represents the level of functionality that's available for Swift on Linux. That's improving all the time, and as we get closer to Swift 3, it's going to be even better, um, but, but f the, the whole of foundation is not yet complete, for example. Um, it does support multiple versions of Swift, though, so different snapshots coming from Swift 3.0 development, they're all available, you can switch between them. Um, and Apparently, you can even use it on your phone, although who would want to write, a photo, write code on their phone? <laughs> the mind boggles. Um, so if you're interested in finding more about what we're doing in IBM uh, to do with Swift, we've got a website, which is developer.ibm.com forward slash Swift. Um, there, we've got a blog and also more information about all the different products that we're working on at the moment as we sort of accelerate towards the Swift 3 release later this year. Um, so I think there's posts from, from me, Chris, and various other engineers around the team about what we're doing. Um, 
we're going to hang around and chat afterwards. Love to hear any feedback people have got if you've tried any of these things out before. Um, especially um, Kitura, if anyone's had a go with that, we'd love to hear how, what you thought of it. And let's see if it's actually managed to finish uploading. It's still going. Okay, we'll give up on the demo. What a shame. What a shame. But that's the risk of these things. Okay, well, thanks a lot, everyone, for listening. I hope it was interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, we're very happy to take questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, how does, what does Kitura do for concurrency? Okay, so the question is, what does Kitura do for concurrency? Um, it uses Grand Central Dispatch for concurrency. So we have a main queue, which HTTP requests are farmed off to. Do we have channels or futures or anything like that? Do we have channels or futures? Uh, no, not at the moment. So the APIs are designed to be asynchronous, um, but behind they're not actually terribly asynchronous behind the covers at the moment. That's something we're going to be working on improving over time. Um, so, so the development experience is familiar to people who have used Express for Node.js, but it, behind the covers it's not as asynchronous as Express is. Mostly basically call, uh, callbacks, callbacks. Yeah, it's, it's callback based at the moment, yeah. Yes? What distributions are you going to support? Um, so Linux distributions are the ones which are supported by the Swift.org project. So I think they target whatever the current release of Ubuntu is and whatever the latest long-term support is of Ubuntu. There are 279 versions of Linux. There are, there are lots of versions of Linux. That's why they can't support them all, right? But maybe uh, more than one? Um, I think... I think that's maybe something that they're going to look at for the future, but currently, uh, if you go to swift.org, the packages that are available are, are explicitly marked for Ubuntu. Um, but I'm sure people have succeeded to run it on other distributions as well. Paul. Um, the mic. No, I'll repeat it. Okay. Um, you mentioned that um, Foundation um, is being ported from the foundation, but that is proprietary closed, as I understand it. Is that, that just sounds like a monumental reverse engineering task. With, what's the situation with foundation? So, so um, Chris might be able to comment on this as well, but um, when Apple open sourced uh, Swift in December last year, at that point they did an initial code drop of a re-implementation of foundation from scratch in Swift with no Objective-C dependencies. Um, that's not complete. Work to fill out the APIs is continuing. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that uh, when they made that cut, that initial drop, they, dis they made a decision that some of the APIs were never going to work on our platforms, that non-Darwin platforms. Um, so there's, there's a limited subset, and some of that is implemented. Um, as we get towards Swift 3, more will be implemented. You're right, there's obviously going to be compatibility issues, um, bugs to be fixed. But this is the official Apple version of Foundation. Yeah, so... so uh, the GitHub repo is on the main Apple Swift re GitHub. It's called Swift Core Libs Foundation. Um, it, it's it's supported by. It's what they recommend for development on Linux. Yeah. Yeah. How about support for database uh, like uh, MongoDB or? Okay. So how about support for databases? Um, I mentioned we've created a, a Redis API as part of Kitora. There's also an existing open source called Swifty MongoDB, I think, which is on GitHub. Um, we've tried that out with Kitora. It seems to work. Um, as for other databases, um, for Bluemix, so for IBM's platform as a service, that offers a wide variety of different uh, databases through a service called Compose.io. Um, and that's all exposed through a REST API. So you'll be able. To, the idea is you'll be able to call through REST from from Kitura. Yeah. Why is IBM investing so heavily in Swift? Yeah, I'll let you handle that one, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, so as a, there's, there's basically three languages that IBM really cares about at the moment. Java, Node.js, and Swift. 
And for Java, we've built a large number of our products on top of Java. And for that reason, you know, we have our own Java runtime. We've invested in the JDK. And we've made sure it's available on all of the hardware that IBM sells. We've done exactly the same thing for Node. Right? We have our own products and applications written in Node.js. Um, and therefore, we, unlike Java, where back in the day there was no open source, it was, here's the specification, go and write your own implementation. For Node.js, we do everything in the community. Um, we're actually, I think, probably the largest single contributor to Node.js now. And we do that because we have products written in Node.js, and we want to be able to you know, both contribute to the community and give ourselves a bit of insurance. It's if we've got a bug, we've got guys that can go and fix it. If we need an enhancement, we're not just going to the community saying, hey, do this because it's good for IBM. We actually go and do it ourselves. Um, the same thing's there for Swift, right? We see it as an interesting server-side language, um, particularly for, for fast startup and good performance. Um, if you um, have heard of things like Amazon Lambda or Microsoft Functions, you know, this server-side event-based programming model, Swift is a really good fit for that. Um, so we're investing in Swift because we're starting to use it ourselves. Yeah. So the question is, do we have any benchmarks on startup times for Swift versus Java. JavaScript versus, um, versus uh, Java? Um, no, I don't to hand. Um, but yes, I mean, they're what you expect, which is Swift starts up very quickly and has high performance out of the gate. Uh, JavaScript starts up slightly slower um, and has good performance to begin with, then it gets slightly better as the JIT kicks in. The JVM is the slowest to start and takes the longest to warm up. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, it, it's probably worth me going and generating those numbers or actually getting Dave Jones to generate those numbers, <laughs> one of our performance guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you envisage a world maybe in the near future where rather than exchanging JSON to and from the server or something like that, uh, do you think there'll be something akin to Google Protocol but there's a bit of Swift? So the question, yeah, the question is, in the future, do we think that JSON is going to be the, the, the payload that people are going to be using, or is there going to be something more Swift-specific? I think there's actually been some talk about this on Swift Evolution, where people have been, have been raising the question, what, what is the serialization future for, for Swift? Um, I think there's, there's an NS Archiver and NS Keyed Archiver and things like that. Um, I think it's an open question. There's going to be nothing in that, in that as for Swift 3, as far as I'm aware. Um, but I think it's an open, open table for the future. Uh, I, I will say that the succinct answer is yes. Right? Um, we're getting to the point that JSON REST is kind of like the, the lingua franca for, for talking between services. And it, that's, that's great, but it really is the lowest common denominator. It allows anything to talk to anything, but it's not particularly performant and it's very verbose. Um, so you're going to get to the point that, um, particularly for, for microservices architectures where you've got many, many services, that time of hopping from one service to the other is what's going to destroy the performance of an application. So the performance between, in, um, between services is actually going to become really, really critical. Uh, so yes, there are going to be things that improve that. Um, I think JSON REST is going to stay there, but it will be, you know, you'll be able to do a handshake like you do with OpenSSL for security and then move to a faster protocol based on what's on the two connections. We certainly do some of that on other languages using RDMA, uh, Remote Direct Memory Access, which is basically a very, very fast I.O. memory channel between the two. Um, and RDMA is something we could definitely bring to Swift. Any more questions? Yeah, at the back. Um, so, uh, is this the question about how is anyone doing this in production yet? Right? Um, no, I don't think anyone is running a production backend on Swift yet. Um, but I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah, we, we've got a couple of people we're working with who are experimenting with this for, for real production apps. But 
you know, um, I, I think it's, f it's safe to say that until Swift 3 arrives, things are moving so quickly that it would be, uh, yeah, probably a little presumptuous to, to try and do that and you know, have a maintainable application. But I think things are really going to start changing from Swift 3 I onwards. think if we came back in a year, the answer would be yes. Yeah. Uh, what about the other direction of going smaller, like embedded things, Raspberry Pis and, and uh, Arduino like? Um, so, so the question is, do we think that Swift's going to move to other embedded devices? Is IBM doing that? Uh, is, is IBM doing that? Um, so I think actually uh, embedded devices and IoT is a really good target for, for Swift, right? It's, it's again one of those places where people have to program in C and C++ today. So having the similar characteristics but the easier programming means it's a, it's a really good fit. Um, the other side of that is when you think about IoT devices as they become more prevalent, um, they're not just going to be endpoint sensors, right? There's going to be some kind of UI that you expect to have. If, if you've got um, a, a sensor in your fridge, you probably want to be able to somehow control that fridge through a UI. So I think the things that are in Swift and its heritage on the client side is actually going to mean it's a very, very good target uh, for, for IoT in general. Now, is IBM doing anything for it? Um, not yet, but we do have an IoT team, we have IoT products, um, and as I said, I think it's a good fit for Swift. So hopefully, with the two coming together, yeah, we will be doing something in the near future. I can't believe Swift's been open sourced for six months and we're already talking about its heritage. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, the interesting thing is there are people who've already ported it to run on the Raspberry Pi, so that's the first stage of getting it on ARM to move it to embedded devices and the like. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, questions about the move to Swift 3, um, whether pi so... Well, basically move fast and break things now or stabilise now and break things So, should we move fast and break things now or stabilise and break things later? I think the decision's been made. We're moving fast and breaking things now. If you read some of the public Swift mailing lists, you'll have seen comments from people in Apple saying, this is our last chance, right, to, to, really, to really fix some of the fundamental things that they want to sort out. Um, in the language and, and in the standard library. Um, so, so the decision's been made, Swift 3 is going to be a major breaking change. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the really nice things about um, the way Swift's been open source, the, the evolution mailing list. Um, it's allowing developers to actually craft Swift to be the language that they want. Right? Everyone can put input in the syntax itself and how you're going to be able to program this language. But it is true that you can't start you know, once a language has got huge adoption, it's very, very difficult to start changing intricate bits of syntax and arguing about how parameters are passed into function. Right? That level of breakage can't happen once it's got a, a big developer community behind it. So I think there's an acceptance that, you know, get people's input now, craft the language that they want, get people to actually, you know, buy in and invest in the language and then stabilize it. And I hope, personally, I hope that's going to happen at Swift 3 because I think, you know, there's going to be a, a bigger and bigger draw of developers over from Objective-C, and after Swift 3, I think it's going to become more and more painful to keep making these breaking changes. But I mean, when you see that there's maybe 800 posts a week on Swift Evolution, you see that people really are contributing to get the language that they want. Over in the corner. Um, so the question is about whether we thought about using a port of Apache Cordova, is that? Oh, core, core, data. core data. Core data. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't think that's anything we've spoken about, is it? Um, no, no. So we haven't looked at porting uh, additional libraries yet. Um, there's certain candidates which are high up our, our list. I mean, if you look at just doing server frameworks, security is a big one. So we've started looking at common crypto, secure transport, keychain services, um, none of which exist in the same form on Linux or the other platforms. So can we have a consistent API that uses OpenSSL on Linux but uses keychain services and so on on, on Apple? Um, 
that's probably higher up the list of things that we would be looking at than, than how to do data database management through things like core data. Um, that will probably come you know, way down the line. Yeah. Uh, is there anything in Swift now or in the coming evolution of Swift that you guys are working more on the Swift back end of things that you think um, is, a, is something that's going to be really negative and, and there might be a trend going in one direction but you might be thinking if only they did this or something that's frustrated that. So the question is, is there anything we can see coming on the horizon with Swift that we think is a, is a negative direction for the language or the ecosystem? <laughs> Um, no, I, I don't think there's anything that like truly concerns us. Um, there's there's interesting things, and you know we we've talked about this uh, quite a few times around things like memory management. So um, reference counting is fantastic for the client uh, because there is no pause time that you get with a full garbage collector, but you do have this problem with cyclic references. Now, on a server. If there's the occasional pause time, that's okay. We, we know that from Node, we know that from Java, we know that from Go and other server-side languages. So we would probably like to explore alternative memory management schemes for the server only. Um, but you know, it's completely accepted that you can't change the functional characteristics of the language or really the non-functional characteristics. So things like dnit, right? dnit has to run immediately even if it's got a different memory management system under the covers. So I think that's something that we're interested in that maybe the rest of the community isn't at the moment. Um, I wouldn't say there's any conflict there at the moment, though. And I think this is a, this, these, are, these kind of things are research topics as well. Yeah. So the question is, what, what have happens about Swift on Android? Um, IBM is not currently involved in Swift on Android, as far as I'm aware, certainly. I don't think there's anything more to say, really. No, no, I mean, we're not doing anything there, but um, I mean, you, you can actually run Swift on Android today, right? Someone's already done it, uh, relying on the fact that you've got you know, the native interface, so you can write a, a Dalvik application that launches a Swift application, but obviously is, it can't do anything. Because, this is through the NDK, is it? Yeah. yeah. But it can't do anything because without APIs that can actually interact with the device, then it's a little pointless. So on a personal level, do you see that going anywhere, or it's just um, that exercise? Um, I mean, it certainly would be very, very convenient, should we say, to be able to write applications once and run them on any platform. Um, this is certainly why Java <laughs> came along and why JavaScript has come along, right? So it would certainly be very, very nice, but you know, it's, it, that's about marshalling a number of device uh, um, companies to actually make that happen. It's, it's not something that we're certainly working on. It's an industry problem, right? Okay, I think we've probably <laughs> had loads of questions, which is fantastic, and we're going to hang around um, if you'd like to come and chat with us during the break, or, and I think there's going to be a panel too. So. Which we're on. Which we're on, yeah. So keep, keep the questions coming. <laughs> Thanks. Thank <you. laughs>